Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Marius Dragomir. Marius is the founding director of the Media and Journalism Research Center that builds on the work of the Center for Media, Data and Society. The center is an international think tank focused on the study of media, journalism, politics and technology. Marius is also a professor at the Central European University in Vienna, where he teaches journalism and research design courses, as well as practical classes on advocacy and policy engagement. Before, he managed the global research and policy portfolio of the program on independent journalism of the Open Society Foundations in London. Okay, Marius, you know about your challenge, telling us how to fix an element included or omitted in the Media Freedom Act. Of course. Um, well, first of all, let me uh, let me start by saying that uh, I have to, to acknowledge that uh, the new act is making a lot of progress in breaking ground in um, uh, protection of um, uh, media freedom in Europe. So I'm really glad to see this act. There are a lot of good things. But if you want to focus on, on a few, let me just talk about three issues that I think are very important to, to address. Uh, the first one is the uh, it has to do with implementation. Uh, so first of all, the good news is that um, I'm really glad to see that the Act is um, is uh, putting forward the idea of creating a European board for media services, a pan-European regulator. We spoke a lot about that. Uh, I mentioned in the past that such a, such regulations and such laws at European Union level would, would not make sense at national level where you have a lot of uh, a lot of politicization without a pan-European instrument uh, to actually implement these laws. So um, uh, this legal provision. So I'm really glad to see that. Uh, but my, my critic here is that um, uh, it seems that this body will, will consist mostly of people coming from the national regulatory authorities, which is great. But what is really missing in my view is the, uh, the presence of civil society. I really believe, uh, especially because we have a lot of issues with independence of national regulatory authorities in some countries in Europe, uh, I strongly believe that you need the presence of representatives of uh, civil society, organizations defending the rights of journalists, uh, people working in, in academic uh, establishments and others. And what is also very important there is to have a very clear system of rotation to make sure that people on this body uh, will change uh, in, in order not to create that dependence between, between regulations and those who are regulated. So this is one issue. The second one has to do with the transparency of ownership. And again, um, I, I, I really commend uh, the uh, the attempt of um, of um, uh, the European Union to regulate that field, I think it, it's it's needed, and um, the uh, the provisions related to the monitoring of media ownership, I think, are very important. Um, but from the very start, I think there are two things here. Uh, why is it important to know who owns the media? I think it is important for the general public, and it is important, secondly, for the enforcement of regulation. While it is, of course, uh, very relevant for people to know who owns the media. Let's be very honest and let's uh, let's uh, agree that not so many people, you know, will look through databases to to find on a daily basis who owns what media outlet operates in a country. But for the enforcement of regulation, you really need data. You really need uh, data to have this uh, these legal provisions implemented. That being said, I think the current mechanisms put forward in the in the legislations uh, in the legislation are not sufficient. Um, a, the, a lot of the uh, of the um, the work in this field is falling on the shoulders of again national regulatory authorities, which is great. They, they should play a role there. But I really think that we have to think about a mechanism um, that would monitor media ownership that would consist more of neutral. Uh, independent organizations and individuals coming, for example, from academia. A lot of the ownership links, for example, cannot be detected by national regulators. This is really difficult work and usually investigative journalists are doing a great job there. So I think a mechanism that would include such people really able to, uh, to dig for ownership links should be, should be created. Secondly, um, we know how difficult and time-consuming it is to, uh, to build uh, an ownership database. That takes years. And also very important why many such initiatives have failed in the past was because they don't have a mechanism to update these uh, uh, this ownership databases. Without updating them, 
in many ways they are useless. We, we see a lot of such cases where you build a database that is not updated for 10 years afterwards. So why, what is the use of that? To really, uh, to really find a way to, uh, to update it on a regular basis, I think what is missing, and I'm not sure whether that should be in the legislation, but that should be in the thinking of implementation of, uh, of the legal provisions, is to also involve as much as possible the existing local resources that deal with that. And here I'm talking about uh, possibly trade registries, institutions that already have the data. Uh, in some countries, statistical offices have a lot of data. So I really think you know, involving more than the national regulatory authorities in this process is really important. Um, and finally, here, I think ownership is not, uh, moni monitoring of ownership is not sufficient, I, especially these days, I think it's really, it really has to be connected with the sources of funding, because the problem that we see in many countries is not as we have seen 20 years ago, namely concentration of ownership, but uh, a lot of trends that have to do with financial concentration. And that leads me to the third issue that I want to, to address here, which is finances. Um, and again, while I'm commending the, uh, the new act for uh, talking about state subsidies, transparency of um, uh, you know, uh, public resources that are given to the media, and there is a lot about state advertising, for example, I don't think the, the act manages to address a key issue, which is uh, cutting the link between the, st the, the state funding um, and the strings attached. Um, and in many places that happens because media owners are connected with a lot of public procurement contracts. Uh, in many countries in Eastern Europe, uh, those, uh, the, the oligarchic structures that own media companies, they are also the main clients to public procurement contracts awarded by the state. So really here, I think we need a set of very specific, as detailed as possible, uh, provisions that, for example, would limit or even, you know, cut completely the access of media owners to public procurement. I think we need also provisions that would limit as much as possible the ownership of some media owners to other industries that, that pose problems to, to their independence. And of course, I, I think that we have to, to really think about legal provisions that would limit access of individuals with certain connections, especially, especially political, to media ownership. So these, are, I think, are, are the three issues that need to be, uh, to be fixed to, to a certain extent. And if, if we really think about the, the, the all three, I think the, the question here is implementation. The Act is very good on paper, but we really need good, detailed provisions to ensure that it will, not, that it will be implemented. Thank you, Marius. So basically, we need to fix, on the one hand, the enforcement implementation at national level and avoid a patchwork uh, to, to be made. Um, and, and to get proper inform uh, enforcement, we need a regulatory body that is independent and that talks to civil society, uh, not just regulators. Um, we need to make sure that uh, the transparency uh, on ownership is done in a way that is dynamic, let's say. So digging by investigative journalists, making sure that it's up to date, making sure that it's accessible um, uh, to everyone. And I see your point that obviously every individual reader does not want to know the ownership, but certainly investigative journalists want to highlight maybe uh, what, what biases that there can be uh, in certain cases in media. And then uh, the third element is when looking at the funding, looking at the ties between how state gives money to media and how that can maybe uh, curtail their freedom <laughs> in terms of expression and, and, and in terms of being bold and challenging uh, maybe the powers uh, in force. Um, and there, obviously, your, your extensive experience of, of Eastern Europe, uh, but it's not just Eastern Europe, let's be honest. It, it happens everywhere uh, these days. Um, media has issues in terms of uh, funding, and so anyone can maybe use those issues to, to put pressure on them and, and, and make their life a bit more difficult in terms of independence. Um, I think that's that's a strong list. Um, I think that is a list where maybe the European Parliament will have more sympathy than certain member states that will feel that Brussels should not meddle <laughs> with these issues. But um, I certainly hope that civil society will 
continue providing these solutions uh, uh, to these uh, issues. And uh, who knows, maybe the parliament will pick it up uh, or even the council. Maybe there will be a bold country that decides to uh, push that forward. Um, thank you so much, Marius, for uh, having taken the time to lay out those three issues. And uh, let's hope that um, people will listen to you. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me to this great program and best of luck. Thank you, Marius.